Nature. It's so part of our lives here in Cordovado Castle, our home in an undiscovered part of Italy called Friuli. For hundreds of years, it's been shaped and formed into formal gardens. The bushes are cut into hedges which guide my feet along gravel paths. An old dead tree has been charmingly turned into a fairy tale throne, with smaller stumps forming seats, which I kind of think looks like a perfect place to meditate or to listen to a story. So today, let me tell you a story about a friend of mine, Julia Hales, who lives with her husband, Jamie McDonald, on the most extraordinary farm in Dorset, England, where, rather than molding nature into a garden, has decided to go wild instead. And so, as part of our trip to London, we decided to rent a car and to visit her and Jamie and the farm to see for ourselves exactly what wilding is. Is that real? It's a marrow, yeah. yeah. It's a giant marrow. Can you eat it? Well, you could do, I presume. If you wanted to. Yeah, you can eat stuff. Here, nature's at the forefront wherever you look, like at the entrance gates, which are heralded by two trumpeting rabbits. And then when you turn around and we walk toward the barn, which is where uh, Jamie keeps his motorcycle collection, you can see that at the top of the entrance is this marvelous frieze, which is Mother Nature and her husband, which also looks like he has some antlers. And then on the corner, hanging out looking at us with amusement, is another rabbit statue. And inside the house, this marvelous creativity and freedom of expression continues. Just look at the colors of the dining room. Nature is everywhere you look, and the furniture and the walls are a happy jumble of bright and bold and happy colors. And look, the woodwork is all round, which reflects nature. There's Julia's hula hoop. And then when you come in, I'm going to show you my favorite room in the house, which is the bathroom, or the loo, as they call it in England, which is accessed through a hidden library door under the stairwell. Now let me open it. And inside, you find a celebration of Jamie's Scottish life on all the walls. Jamie is the epitome of Scotland. And after all, once a Scot, always a Scot even if you're living in Dorset. Are you ready to go? Yeah. But these aren't just whimsical follies. In order to achieve a lightness like this, it takes depth. Julia happens to be one of the UK's most foremost experts in the field of sustainability. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I will only be a moment because I can tell okay, I can't. So where are we going? Uh, we're going up to the insect house. We're doing okay. just a long trip around the property. Yes, yeah. okay. Julia not only has received an MBE, that's the member of the British Empire, for her work in sustainability, she's a pioneer in the field, and also in renewable energy and in the environment, and she's got a list of achievements that's about a mile long. Uh, never mind that she authored about nine books on the subject, including a number of bestsellers. And then when we walk on the property, the first thing I see is a Stonehenge that wasn't there before. And I find out that they brought these stones uh, that came on these huge trucks to create their own little Stonehenge. And that means that the trucks had to carry the stones up and then they had to roll it up. And a third of those stones is underground. So this is your own stone circle? Yes. We just thought it was rather lovely. And if you actually noticed, I mean, part of the whole wilding thing here is that we wanted it not only to be wild, but not just scrubby, but actually with something rather wonderful in different places. So all around the, the site, we've got different features. And the first thing that she shows me is something they call the Insect Palace, which they built with all the things that insects love, so that they can burrow and wriggle and nest to their heart's content. They must be quite a lot in there because there's a lot of spiders and cobwebs, <laughs> and they wouldn't be there catching nothing. But... Um, and actually, you can see that some of the holes have been plugged. Some of the holes in the roof. Have yeah. Been plugged, which is probably yeah. Have but, but basically, that means that there's a a bee or some sort of thing that you see here. Oh yes, it's yeah. True. That's indicative of that's of, a front door. They yeah, just so effectively it and like there that. too. Yes. Now, something rather amazing to tell you about about that is that you can realise that insects have personalities. And when we went to Costa Rica. We were having a look at all these trapdoor spiders, and they were all in the banks. And then the woman who was giving us a thing about them, she said, well, this one, he normally closes the door very smartly. <laughs> um, and so she poked it, and he went, 
shut the door immediately. <laughs> and then there was another one that apparently was a bit more like today. Total. A bit wild to, <laughs> to shut the door. And I just thought it was so amazing because it suddenly made me realise that they, you know, even in the insect world. Well, it makes it come alive, yes. you know. And somebody's been talking about, you know, insects actually playing with balls and things like that and uh, the things. So I've become fascinating about the fascinated about the world of insects. It's just completely amazing riveting and there are so many individual stories about them which I think is so illuminating. It is such a pleasure to come to Hook Farm because there's a sense of lightness and fun with living in the country and also wilding. It, it's, it's a change, I would say, it's a change in understanding within yourself to realize that you know humanity is not the center of the world but that we are the caretakers of the planet. And if we don't improve our caretaker ability, we're going to lose our job. Okay, Ziggy, show us the way. We are in times of transition, and that's really difficult on everyone. Our news stations are filled with war and destruction glorious. and environmental problems English and basically just fear. So coming here is like a breath of fresh air, literally. Wilding is the process of renewing an ecosystem and basically just letting nature come to the fore. Nature knows what it's doing, as long as man just gets out of the way. And that's the throne. Yes. I remember that. And it's lovely, I mean, you like meditation, don't you? So yes. The giant chair is perfect. perfect. Just sitting on there, looking at the view, and sometimes I bring a bean bag up, and sit on it in the most comfortable way, and then just look down over the valley beyond. Oh, it's wonderful. So here, they're celebrating nature and they're trying to make you, in every step, enjoy everything that's around us so that we can take it in with all of our senses. Later on in the video, we're going to be hearing Julie interview the person who began the wilding movement 20 years ago. But for now, I want to show you wilding done the Julia and Jamie way. So their entire property is dotted with all sorts of extraordinary things. They have their stone circles, and they have this wonderful throne. They also have these large patches of land where they're planting wild flowers. And then also that means that because things are natural, they don't actually work as planned, such as this bat egg, which was built entirely from freestanding stones. Work. Didn't work. Um, it didn't work it's so you, it's your first ruin. <laughs> I'm actually really excited by it because it, it took, you know, a few minutes I thought, oh gosh, that's terrible. Then I thought, no, it's not terrible at all. It's actually brilliant because at the back you can see that the original bat egg and what it would have looked like. Yes. Um, and it's even got the bat egg cave, which is intact. And then here we've got the ruin as it's felt fallen down. And we've, we've, we've uh, slightly cemented it to just try and put some mortar on it to hold it, to hold it in its ruined state. And then we've got some sort of sandy stuff there so that we can, um, the plants can fix on it. And we are going to cover it in wildflowers. Perfect. And I think it's actually going to be even more spectacular than the original vision of it. I met Julie and Jamie about 10 years ago when they attended one of my Scottish reeling extravaganzas where we danced on the ramparts of the Merengar Fort in Jodhpur, Rajasthan as the guests of the Maharaja of Jodhpur. In fact, that's Jamie and me reeling together in the city palace in Jaipur, which was on a painting that was given to me by the Scots a few years ago. When I met Julie and Jamie in India, Julie looked familiar to me, and when we began talking, I realized that I did know her. In fact, I had interviewed her about 20 years previously when I was a reporter and presenter for BBC World Television. What was the subject? Sustainability in business. Helping make the world a better place was something that was important to both of us. Then and now. And there's another um, bee uh, bird box which has been taken up by bees. In fact, you could see there was a bee flying out of it just now. Look, did you see it going in and out? I don't oh, yes, really know see. quite what, I mean, a lot of them die off in the winter, but obviously a few of them must be yeah, yeah, up yeah. there and then they sort of go to sleep, but they don't seem to be asleep yet. Well, if I were a bee, I wouldn't want to be asleep yet. Yes. <laughs> there's still quite a lot of things happening. Careful Yeah. And then, as you're uh, aware, that we've got this thing which is called a sweet track. And it's called a sweet track because somebody sweet discovered it on the Somerset levels. And it's what they used to use in medieval times as a way of walking across the, the, the boglands and the wetlands. 
And so we've actually got it, not just here, but actually right, right around the, the, the lower water meadow. And it's just a way of... And it means that you can walk all the way through the, the boggy areas without getting your feet sort of wet and, and uh, the things, and see all the, you know, all the things. That... I find it fascinating to see the circular economy at work. Everything I see is recycled materials, it's collecting waste, reducing carbon, and making a positive impact on the planet. The entire property has been transformed into natural habitats for a wide variety of species, from bees to barn owls. They've installed ponds and sowed wildflower meadows and are nurturing hedges and edges so that all of the insects can return. There's a playfulness here that's remarkably refreshing, and I realize it's not necessary to take everything quite so seriously as I do, and that means especially myself. And with Julia's help, I do just that. Okay, you two, off the trampoline for the video. All right, hang on. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Is it strong enough for Yes, yes, yes. What? <laughs> Do you want to film Nina and uh, singing? Okay, there we go. Now this is, you may find this rather odd, but I've got three grown-ups behaving like three-year-olds on a thing. They're not very good at it, may I say, but you know, what can one expect? Okay. <laughs> Eric's given up. You wouldn't believe, judging by Julia's calm, that she's about to talk to 400 people who are waiting to hear her interview the founder of the Wilding Movement, Isabel Tree, in a few hours. So once we finish with the trampoline, we prepare ourselves and get into the car where we drive to the town of Bridport, where the literary festival is waiting for us. Right. Okay. Last year we had George Monbiot, um, but this, the, you know, these, um, oh, I need to remember the news readers, we've got Clive Murray is here this okay. year, okay. and that marvellous chap who does the Middle East, Jeremy Bowen, um, he's, he's talking, so lots of people, the whole week of completely jam-packed, really good speakers, so fantastic. and it's very popular, a lot of them get booked out, and obviously Isabella Tree is immensely popular, because started the sort of welding revolution 20 years ago. She Was it 20 is, years ago? Yeah, and she's become like a beacon of welding, really. I call her the queen of welding. Uh, it's it's well, fantastic. So lots of people want to come and hear her. And she's got her new book, out, which uh, obviously we're going to be hearing all about. It's called The Book of Welding. And how is it that, um, when she did the wilding before, is this... A is this her first book? No, she's done, she's done well. She's done quite a lot of books. She's done some for children, but the one that really sort of brought her to attention was a book just called Wilding, and it told the story of her and her husband, um, who had inherited this large estate in Sussex, and it was farmed in a completely industrial way, as has become a common thing. Um, and it was making no money, and it was absolutely wrecking the land. And you'll see because she's got a few slides illustrate that sort of monoculture landscapes with absolutely nothing and how they have completely transformed it because they took out all the fences they let it go wild they've got sort of wild species of cows and and pigs and uh, things on the on the land and so this latest book that she's done is called the book of wilding and um, it, it shows it's like a manual of what to do and so it shows what she's done in her situation, but it also goes out into other areas like the Scottish Highlands and why it's so destructive to have sheep on the uplands and that the government are actually paying the farmers to have the sheep where they don't make any money from it and they're destroying the land, so it's completely bonkers. And in fact, some of the things that she highlights are legislation that's gone mad because it's all supporting industrial agriculture rather than 
um, bringing about wildlife and biodiversity and other uh, things. And one of the things we'll definitely be discussing is a lot of people raise the issue about food production and whether this is in conflict with food production. But I think she will very amply illustrate that this is actually fundamental for the future of food production. And she learning to live basically with the rhythms of nature and the planet as opposed to against it. Yeah. You know, how to harness it and live with it together. And you've got to identify that there are masses of, uh, there's masses of bits of land that could be wild if it isn't bit productive for food and should be teeming with wildlife. And so that's what we've done on a mini scale at Hook, is that we've brought in all the things we can do to encourage the wildlife back. And what we're trying to do is, where's it, Isabella Tree, and Charlie Barr was our husband, have sort of illustrated what you can do on a vast estate and, and uh, you know, and they've got examples of sort of agriculture and things. What we're trying to do is show what you can do on a smaller scale, and we've got lots of mini examples of, you know, how to do this in the garden. There's a lot of joy that can be had from, from uh, this, and bringing back nature is really a joyful thing. And so I wanted it not just to look like a scrubby piece of land that had lots of wildlife, but actually had, you know, something that you could really enjoy, and then lots of little quirky features along the way, and hence the fact we've done a rather wacky hen house, for example. If I were a chicken, I would be so happy. The hen house so is Jane's going, responsibility. The chickens, which he calls his girls, are perched on a hill overlooking the farmhouse. They get fresh organic feed and water daily, and even a visit from a local pheasant which flies in daily for a snack. The chickens don't mind the visit from the pheasant, but they really don't like to have their doors open and then their chicken coop cleaned out, as this chicken clearly is telling me. If you could hear what chickens speak, I think that's not very nice. <laughs> Right. Two eggs? Two eggs. Yeah, we got two eggs. Okay. Yeah, lovely eggs. All right. No, I hear you. But it's not, life is not that bad, really. Oh, okay, all right. He's, she says otherwise. And I do have to say. Right, there's a little clean up here. Look at this, look. You have little chicken heads and wings and... There's little heads on their little roofs. And the beautiful chickens. You can tell that they're happy chickens, though. And there's one cock, right? One, one rooster, yeah. One rooster. And by the time we get to Bridport, I feel a little bit like these chickens. The town is packed. There are so many cars and people on the streets that we have to drop Julia off close to where she's giving the talk and then we seem like we park a mile away and then we have to wander through the town to get to the electric palace and um, there's a Saturday market so there's so many people on the streets but it's got a wonderful atmosphere so when we get to the electric palace which is where the Bridport Literary Festival is we see that there's a line a mile along and so even though we know Julia we have to wait another 20 minutes to get into the electric palace Isabella Tree and Julia Hale's names are that well known that it is completely sold out Okay, could my group come follow me? Okay. Right. Guest of Julia Hales. Okay. Uh, you are? There's Jamie and Arik and Monty and Bruna and Nadia. The talk is riveting, and I see that I have the good fortune to be sitting in front of two extraordinarily brave, pioneering women. One in the field of sustainability, and the other in wilding. These two ideas still aren't accepted by the status quo, and it's never very easy to change a perception. And what they were doing, but at the beginning, probably even now, they weren't universally popular with the audiences of the other farmers, for example, who really felt that we should be continuing to industrialize our landscape. I've learned that in order for a person to be truly effective, you need to clean up your own backyard first, rather than telling other people or countries or cultures what they must or ought to do. And that is exactly what Isabella and Charlie had to do when they changed their estate, Knep, into something that works together with nature. And at the end of his little speech, there was just stony silence. <laughs> they didn't really like what they heard. So tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, I mean, we do really remember that meeting because, you know, we, we assumed that, I mean, we're on, you know, terrible Sussex heavy clay, um, which is the reason we stopped farming in the beginning. And, um, you know, we sit on 320 metres of this stuff, so it's unfathomable. And we're really marginal land for people, you know, who, who know the farming talk. We're sort of grade three, grade four. And so we just weren't making a profit. And we assumed that when we'd found this wonderful get-out clause, that we could actually do something for nature and be paid to do it. Um, so be paid to restore our soils, be paid to get nature back. Um, finding all these extra income streams like ecotourism and things that are actually going to make our estate viable as a business for the first time in probably 50 or 60 years, um, that other farmers around us would want to join in. And so when we had this um, uh, a meeting where we invited people, to neighbours to come and listen to our plans, um, Charlie had drawn up this fantastic map we're three and a half thousand acres, and he'd drawn up a, a map of a notional um, 10,000 acres, including our neighbours, you know, bound, boundaried by big roads and rivers, a kind of natural block that could be an amazing project. And I think we just assumed, I mean, we're in our 20s, I suppose quite arrogantly, that they would want to join in, and none of them did. Um, you know, they were so horrified. So we realised there was this huge gulf between kind of, you know, what we saw as a great opportunity and, a, and, a, and an exciting thing to do, and then a kind of cultural um, fixation, as it, as it were. <laughs> Needless to say, the talk went really well, and all of us were on the edge of our seats. But she was so good, wasn't she? She was just like, she just got full of everything. Oh, poor, poor Ziggy. Now he gets the nice bits and he gets all the, the lovely towel dry. And, then... and by the time we came home, it had begun to rain, which meant that after a long walk, Ziggy needed a good bath. And we decided that the only thing left to do is to dance to a song on Jamie's car, which is appropriately called Raindrops. Martha Graham, the modern American choreographer and dancer, once said, dance is the language of the soul, and I completely agree with her. I met Jamie and Julia through the Scottish balls that I created all over the world, and now through that, I've come full circle, and I'm returning home to work and play with people who think and act like I do. No matter where in the world you are, take a moment, breathe, smile, and appreciate being alive. There are shortcuts to happiness, and dancing is one of them.